I will, I will use the microphone again. This is Marcus Kulnick speaking. Uh, the idea was we look a little bit uh, back what worked well with the session, what maybe could or should we have done differently, but we also want uh, to look forward and we started this discussion uh, yesterday. But before we go into that, I know that uh, David, you wanted to and we cut you off yesterday, you want to make an intervention. So let's start with you, it would be fair to you. <laughs> Thank you, Marcus. Um, what I wanted to say, um, so I read a bit what you've been doing, it has to sort of go into the SDGs. And in my daily work, one of the big problems we are facing is medical devices, not just IoT devices, but medical equipment. Um, the life cycle of the software and the hardware are often not compatible. You buy a machine that will go for 20 years, but the software has uh, will only be 15 or 10 years. Then we also have the problem of um, updating these machines, the software controlling them. So you might have a, a radio, um, uh, how do you, an X-ray machine with a controller which is on um, Windows, and this whole system is certified. So not just the machine, but also the controller, so it's both of them. And I've had one hospital sending me an email, and it's not the only one, but about two months ago, and still saying, well, they wanted to buy a new uh, X-ray machine, and the pro manufacturer was saying, we will only sell it to you with XP on it. So 2017, um, X-ray machine controlling with uh, I yeah, XP. So I was wondering to which degree that could also be something, because we have the manufacturers that we have to get in, there's maybe also um, sector-specific reg regulators, depending on the countries, how this is functioning. Um, we have the hospitals, the whole management team, and then also just cybersecurity in general um, in hospitals. So that, that was maybe a, a question how you would see that. Thank you. Um, uh, Terry, could you also introduce yourself? Or the, uh, we don't have transcription, but we do have... Uh, in, th in theory, on people may be online. So yeah. and th that goes well with the others. When you speak, please introduce yourself. Yeah. So D David Rufnat from Melanie. Um, we're the Critical Infrastructure Protection Agency in Switzerland. Thank you very much, David. And, and that's a very interesting question indeed. Uh, for this year, the goal was to come up with a set of policy recommendations or, or things that uh, states, but also other stakeholders, should take into account when they come up with guidance or, or policy. Um, I do believe in our current draft we have at least one reference to life cycle um, of devices. And so I really appreciate you bringing this up because I think it's a major concern. And in fact, there's been a few people at the IGF this week that have brought this up to, to me and others in the technical security community. Uh, in particular, given what happened in the UK this year with the National Health Service. I think we can use your input to help clarify that a little bit in the document and spell out some of these concerns, because I think you raised a couple of different things, that the software and hardware are often different in terms of support life cycles, and that because of that, sometimes even today, hardware is being sold that only supports software that's technically already out of date by the vendor. And so it becomes a very difficult question if that machine is compromised using a vulnerability in the software, is that actually the fault of the software vendor who is actually no longer selling the product or of the hardware vendor that's including a product that actually technically should no longer be sold. So I think this is a great example to add to the document and uh, I'll, I'll work with our consultant, uh, Wim Digezelle, to, to see if we can clarify that in there using uh, your comments. Thank you. Uh, to those who came in lately, the purpose of this session, which was scheduled uh, only after our last call, I think, so uh, it was a bit ad hoc, but we felt it would be merit in having a session where we can sort of brainstorm a bit, uh, look back at the whole of a year's work and uh, take stock and also see what we could or should have done maybe differently and how to improve and then look forward uh, what uh, we should do next. Uh, we cannot take it as a given that the DPF on uh, cybersecurity will be renewed, although I have a strong feeling it will be renewed as it is a important issue and there was a strong interest throughout uh, this IGF in this issue. But uh, we should uh, collectively not just say uh, we 
want to be renewed. It's not just should be more than just a binary decision. The new mag will then decide on the program, but it would be my hope that we also come with suggestions. We already had this discussion on other issues, other themes uh, that should be taken up. And that can be taken up in any other form. That would be up to the MAC and decide what to do with the suggestions, whether it should be a main session, whether it should be a workshop or a new BPF. But uh, as a best practice forum on cybersecurity, I think it would also be helpful if we make a concrete suggestion. And there are two themes on the table. Uh, and we looked at these uh, yesterday, but I open the floor for discussion. Maybe can we first have comments on what you thought uh, was good with this year's exercise, or what should have, what we should have done differently? Personally, I thought it was a, a very solid discussion we had yesterday. And the fact was, we actually we ran out of time. It's usually a good sign. There was still some interest. We did not squeeze every drop out of it. And I think also the paper that is still up for comment, and you are encouraged to make use of this, and here is Wim, who, Wim who's holding the pen for the document. Uh, you are still encouraged to make uh, comments. It's still open for comments, and the final version will take into account all the discussions, also the discussion at the main session on cybersecurity. So who would like to comment? <coughs> Martin, do you want to get the discussion started? <laughs> sure. Oh. sure, so um, thank you very much, Marcus, and thanks everyone for coming as well. So related to things that we did last year, I think there have been a few concerns, not necessarily concerns, but uh, things that could have gone better that were already raised, and I'll, I'd actually like to put those out there to see if that's a complete list or if there are things that are missing or things that we feel we can do something practically about. I think the first challenge that we had was that it has consistently over the last few years proven a little bit more difficult to get government stakeholders involved and private sector stakeholders uh, rather than um, civil society, which has actually been very, very uh, active in the best practices forum. A couple of the reasons that were raised for that was the fact that we are actually a little bit more informal than I think the typical UN forum in the sense that much of our discussion takes place on a mailing list, uh, much of our discussion takes place on calls, and then we have one formal session typically at the end of the year. And so I reached out to some private sector participants halfway uh, through the year and some other BPF participants reached out, reached out to governments. And one thing we learned was that the mailing list as a tool is often a little bit less accessible because it's conversation and it's not necessarily purely submitting a contribution. As another example to that, um, contributions are typically sent to the mailing list. And in the case of these other stakeholders, there were some requests to send them, uh, in some cases, directly rather than to the mailing list, perhaps for technical issues or perhaps uh, because they, they did not necessarily want to join the, the discussion on the list immediately. So that's, I think, one challenge that we had uh, this year. The other uh, challenge that was raised was that we got started in about April, I think, this year, after the MAG renewal. And there have been some suggestions that if we have a more year-round trajectory, in some way, we could potentially start making progress earlier in the year. Those are the two main ones I've heard. Well, we did actually have calls well before we got officially renewed. For the proposal. For yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, so we, it was not so that we waited and we had a good head start as a lot of best practice forums this year uh, started much later. Whereas we, uh, you know, we already prepared the ground and when we are re renewed, we hit the ground mm -hmm. running. So that is, yeah. but the, uh, the government participation for government representatives, uh, it's not that easy to join yeah. this kind of working method is also government representatives don't work uh, participate in a private capacity they have always mm -hmm. have to consult with colleagues other officers but anyway i'm very happy we have here <laughs> with david we have someone who works for a government and uh, amit ashkenazi who's here uh, he approached me just before the session and i was in expressed his interest and i said why don't you join us he works 
for the Cyber Bureau in the Prime Minister's Office uh, of the Israeli government. I wonder whether you would like to say a few words on that, what, how as a government representative, uh, you know, what are the limits and how you can engage? Obviously, we would greatly welcome you engaging uh, with us going forward. So, um, thank you for this welcome. First of all, my business card also says I'm the legal advisor. So take note of that. <laughs> um, <laughs> and what I say now may not be the official uh, government positions. But uh, in any case, I'll say a general statement and then maybe uh, go back to being the audience here. Uh, first of all, what we, the Israeli cybersecurity strategy embraces uh, discussions with all the stakeholders domestically because cybersecurity is a joint mission. And this was a very, um, a very crucial element in our cybersecurity strategy from the beginning because we understood that this is different than the way governments do security and uh, safety in other areas because without cooperation you won't, uh, you won't succeed and, um, and as a result of that um, there are many um, relationships, I would say interface is the word I like to use in which government works with or sometimes regulates or sometimes cooperates or sometimes finances different uh, sta stakeholders in order to promote the, the, the cyber security mission. So this is a very broad statement. And from the institutional point of view, we've set up a separate establishment to do domestic cyber security, which is the organization I work for. So this was also part of the strategy in order to delineate the responsibilities and the institutional design and the legal framework as well for dealing with the attacks and dealing with the attackers. So dealing with the attackers, there's the responsibility of security establishment, law enforcement, etc. But what we've seen and learned over the years is that you need to mitigate the attack before you um, engage with the attackers maybe, because maybe you don't know who the attacker is, but there are serious risks to um, to important interests even before you can uh, um, engage with the attacker. So we need the uh, government involvement in attacks. And this is what we do through our national CERT, through our information sharing networks, and through our information sharing sectoral uh, centers. And in the context of uh, the IGF and this discussion, uh, what we understand is that uh, c as countries move forward, we want to share this experience. We want to share this way of thought. And maybe it can be useful in order for countries moving forward to understand or to promote better understanding for themselves of their role with regard to cybersecurity. Because there are a lot, it's a big world, a lot of people understand it differently. And, and that's why we had a discussion uh, yesterday about cybersecurity and the multi-stakeholder model. And in this context, I would say, sorry for the American uh, legal term, I'm, the jury is still out on where we can utilize this platform for these types of discussions because we want to promote global interoperability in this area. And uh, maybe again using a legal theorist uh, called uh, Lawrence Lessig, he wrote about 20 years ago about the interface with law, society, technology. And sometimes his uh, thoughts are missing from the discussion. The lawyers need to understand the role of the law. Technologists need to acknowledge the role of technology. Policy makers need to acknowledge them both. And sometimes they are pa talking past each other. So we need to create these types of interfaces in the community. And again, we're looking for where to take this discussion uh, globally so we can create um, agreement around things which are simple and I think agreed by a lot of the players, which means that we need a secure and safe um, cyber environment in order to do whatever we may do. And there maybe we have th disagreement between countries about the way values are structured. But we're not in disagreement about the need for the below the top, I would say, uh, system to function. And um, so, so this is basically why I'm here in the room and listening to this conversation because obviously you've had um, made important progress in this area. Um, and we need to learn from your experience exactly as you framed it. What is working, what is not working, and I would say from an Israeli pragmatic point of view, what is the added value of doing this discussion in this place? And I think there is a lot of value because, uh, because it's so open and so multi-stakeholder. But 
again, I'm still assessing that. Thank you. Thank you very much for this. This is fits in very well in what we have been doing. Right at the beginning, we asked ourselves, what is our add value added? And there was a general sense uh, what the IGF, what we can do in the IGF context is precisely that. We can bring all stakeholders together, we can break down the silos, we can try and find a common understanding and a common language. And in our view, uh, th and that was also came out, I think, fairly clearly in this main session on cybersecurity, uh, there is no other forum uh, like that where really all the stakeholders are under one roof. So uh, you're very much in line with our thinking, so we obviously strongly encourage you to engage in the IGF context. But you ask for the forum, please uh, also yeah. uh, state your name. Yes, uh, Adli Wahid from IPNIC. Um, I thought I've, I wanted to uh, give two inputs on perhaps uh, future BPF activities. One is uh, maybe we can consider getting the uh, national and regional IGF uh, to participate in some of the discussion. And this is perhaps more on the st strategically engaging whoever is attending or whoever is organizing activities there to either create awareness about this activity so that they can participate on the mailing list or wherever we are uh, doing this activity and also perhaps consider maybe having a smaller, um, I don't know, engagement to get people to uh, give feedback or inputs from many of the IGFs that are happening around the world before the main IGF. Um, the second input is more about the logistics uh, of this meeting here. I find that many of the rooms are very congested uh, and maybe the sitting arrangements are also make things very difficult because uh, from our session the other day, I feel that some people tried to uh, intervene and make intervention, but it is they're not seen from 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 the front because of the sitting arrangements. So maybe something for consideration in the future if this if this is within our control, uh, but to make the discussion more more uh, interactive and more comfortable for, uh, with the participants. And both to both. Comments are well taken, but uh, but to both of them, uh, we try to reach out to the NRIs, but we get limited feedback. But obviously, there's always room for improvement. And if you who are in the regions like APNIC, you know, can help us, that would be greatly appreciated. And the second one, of the rooms, uh, they are what they are. It's the UN here. Uh, they actually have made, uh, but I don't think it really took off. Uh, the IGF secretariat had some. Uh, electronic viewing system, but it, uh, I think nobody used it, you know, precisely to avoid that. And also uh, for remote participation, that we, uh, you know, we are essentially committed to take them in, but it doesn't always work as well as it could have done. But uh, uh, there's nobody here anymore handling the remote participation in case anyone wants to come in. But uh, now all these comments are well taken. Uh, who else want, was Sivas you wanted before? Uh, and please introduce yourself. Uh, what is positive about uh, the BP on cybersecurity this year is that uh, uh, the, uh, the recognition that uh, multi-stakeholder process could do some good to cybersecurity and uh, the increasing discussions on the multi-stakeholder model and security and I had a discussion with a participant, a fellow participant this morning, and he was saying that uh, if uh, the various issues in cybersecurity are identified and one issue can be experimentally taken to uh, be on the multi-stakeholder model fully, that would be a way forward. And another possible way is to generally consider uh, uh, including uh, security for, for the multi-stakeholder process and then maybe reserve the top secret areas for intergovernmental process or the strategies or the actual responses to internet, uh, uh, the intergovernmental process, but uh, keep the broader policy aspects for open for multi-stakeholder discussion. Thank you. Thanks. I'm uh, Paul Wilson. I'm the head of, of APNIC. Um, we've supported the BPF to the extent of Ad Adley's um, participation, but I'm afraid I haven't been, been able to. 
uh, do so much, and I haven't also been able to follow this this um, event. Uh, but a, a few comments. Um, from our point of view as a uh, regional internet registry serving thousands of, uh, of operators in the region and interacting a lot outside of that community, I mean, security is just skyrocketing as a concern, um, practical uh, solutions and the, the need for, for practical uh, answers to problems is, is huge. I really hope that uh, the BPF uh, you know, can serve uh, a purpose and it will go on. Um, in fact, I think when I look at, um, when I think about the, the opening of this IGF compared with early IGFs, I'm a bit alarmed actually at the, at the change of tone from something that used to be very expansive and developmental to something that was frankly full of um, fear and loathing about, secu about security and threats on the internet. I mean, that is, that's a very fundamental, very deep change I think over 10 years and I, I really would like to see security put in its place as a very important internet issue without it dominating the entire the event as kind of the the first thing that people think about when they think of internet, internet governance. So I think it would be really important to have more dedicated space for security discussions in, in the IGF. And this, this might be out, out of the scope of a discussion about this B, BPF. I, um, I, I concede uh, that, um, but I, I do think the BPF has got a really an important place uh, for those for those re reasons, and I really hope it uh, it would go on. I've got another another related comment, which is that um, security is on everyone's minds at the moment, and there are a lot of security events uh, that happen, and a lot of potential for duplication and confusion. <coughs> and, I, and I really think I would hope that um, again, it might not be a BPF um, thing, uh, a priority in itself, but I think um, really sort of trying to to resolve the um, duplications by creating more inter interconnections is, is pretty important as well. So for instance, the, the GFCE, the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise is something that's very oriented towards capacity building and, and case studies and, uh, and best or, or good, uh, good common practices. And, uh, and there is some duplication and it would be, it, duplication isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, you know, the, the security has it's got, a, got its place in the IGF of course, but the to, uh, to create the interconnections and to really leverage off, off each other just seems to be a, a very um, important thing to avoid just simply reinventing <laughs> and, and recovering the same, the same old ground in, in different places. I think it can actually add a lot uh, to, um, to the overall joint um, product of, of all of these parallel uh, um, initiatives if they're um, better, better uh, coordinated with each other. Thanks. Thank you for that. And, uh, Yes, a high-level comment. I mean, very much appreciate. Uh, we have been going with at the IGF since the beginning, and uh, <laughs> also noticed that. And security has always been with the IGF as a, an issue, but also early on, we realized it should not be a trade-off: security versus openness, but that they should be mutually reinforcing. And this notion, I heard that also clearly in this year's IGF. I mean, we have a obviously a strong civil society uh, participation and they always make the point that it should not be at the cost of human rights. And there again, uh, this is also, I think, uh, value added uh, the IGF can bring to the discussion, that it should not, s some governments then see exactly, then say see, uh, see security first and forget about the rest. So that is something which is very much in the DNA of the IGF. Uh, Martin, would you like to uh, yeah, comment so far? Um, well, a, a couple of little ones, perhaps. Uh, I think the, the first thing I'd like to touch on is the NRI engagement, because uh, I think this is really critical for us as a forum to, to get this right. And so this year, uh, for the first time, really, we engaged specifically with the NRI focal point to figure out what the best way would be to engage with them. And the result of that was that we changed the phrasing of our questions to really fit in with the NRI program. Because there are some things that are unique about the NRIs, and I'm probably the least qualified to speak about them, but one of the things that comes up is, for instance, that within some NRIs, consultation is required when a question is asked of them. And that's a fairly lengthy process. So as a result, what we ended up doing was we rephrased our questions to fit into work that the NRIs had already done, and so they had an easier time contributing to us. 
uh, we did get some feedback from the NRIs and we did get some more input than last year. So I think a first step was made. I do not think that was enough. I think there is a lot more our group can do. And one of the things that we should, should consider is leveraging some of the people that are within the individual NRIs that participate within the group to be sort of that point of, uh, of, of contact and point of enablement. Uh, so if you look at the document that, we pr that we're producing this year, it has a very uh, succinct set of policy um, ideas, policy suggestions. Those policy suggestions come from individual contributors, are then assessed by the wider group and merged. I think one of the benefits of the session yesterday that we had was that we had experts comment on some of those ideas and provide um, additional deepening of them, deepening that can now make it into the document. And actually, for example, the contribution earlier um, about medical devices is a really good example of something that strengthens uh, what we're describing to be an issue. And one thing that I think we, we could focus on more in um, a future iteration is to work more closely with the NRIs around getting them um, specifically have them identify some experts within their region that can comment on these outcomes and then help make the final document better. So it's just one suggestion of many possibilities, but I, I completely agree with you, Adli, that that's something that we really need to uh, spend time doing and find better ways of engaging. And perhaps that's a great question also to ask on the mailing list to see if people from the NRIs themselves can provide input. Then second, related to the duplication, um, I completely agree, and this has been a concern of us this year as well, in the sense that we asked participants to provide what they consider to be the greatest security issue that can be addressed through a multi-stakeholder dialogue or multi-stakeholder approach. And we got a list of 18 specific ones, and in addition to just having that list, we started compiling a list of other forums where work on these is happening. And hopefully that will help uh, make it a little bit easier to engage with some of these forums. Because uh, I agree there are overlaps with, for instance, the GFCE. We did some work this year um, and they making the GFCE aware of the work that was happening here. And they even went as far as sending an invitation to some of their members asking uh, to contribute to the work we were doing. So completely agree. And, and this is something that I think we need to carry uh, very much forward and, and really consider what is it that we are doing and what are other forums where that wor work may already be taking place and how can we reinforce each other. So I, I really like that point and I appreciate you raising it. Just one follow-up question on the on the BPFs. Um, this is out of my uh, my own ignorance, but are there NRIs with B with a cybersecurity BPF at all? Do do the NR do any of the NRIs um, have an, an equivalent that um, that can sort of lock in with the global the global one? I'm not aware of it. I thank you. I don't think so. I, uh, and the the BPFs are really just at the global level so far, but. Again, to build on what Martin said, I think a, a very simple way would be maybe to ask to have a dedicated call with the NRIs mm -hmm. just to explain what we are doing and how we can cooperate in the field. This should be the easiest, that we're all under the same roof and yeah. the calls are supported by the IGS, etc. Other comments, suggestions? Yes, please. Okay. And can you please introduce yourself? Thank you, Marcus. Winston Roberts, um, I'm here wearing an NGO hat, actually, one of them. Um, but I am actually a government servant in New Zealand, um, but I'm not speaking here as a government servant. But if I was, then I would say that I would be a bit nervous about coming along to such a forum and talking about cybersecurity. I won't say any more than that, <laughs> because who knows who may be listening. Uh, you know the remote listeners. Um, however, I would like to make a, a point, and not that wasn't intended to be a facetious comment, it's perfectly serious, but uh, another comment is that there was, uh, the, or there was at least one diplomat that I identified here at this meeting who came specifically to hear what might have been said or what might be proposed seriously or wildly in a session that was um, to discuss uh, Microsoft's suggestion of a Geneva Convention on um, a, a digital convention on protection of cyberspace. I forget the exact title of the proposal. And the reason for that diplomat's attendance here was to see 
it w was triggered, I suppose, by the magic words Geneva Convention. Um, I mean, th the that that seemed, I suppose, the psychology of that approach was that it seemed to elevate the debate away above the level of a multi-stakeholder discussion and uh, made it immediately political. So perhaps that was Microsoft's intention. Um, you know, uh, but there are ways of involving, uh, thinking of your comment originally that it's a shame that there are not more government sector people here to add uh, sort of gravitas to the discussion, shall we say. Um, that's one way of doing it, is by pitching the debate at the level where the stakes are clear in, in the titling of the session. Uh, thank you for that. No, I mean, the, uh, we are aware, obviously, of the sensitivity, but that's why I'm particularly pleased that uh, well, we have now three government representatives <laughs> in the room to have this discussion. And the way uh, Amit uh, fra uh, framed it, the discussion, I think you would not plan to give away any state secrets, but rather <laughs> to move to a high level of principle. So please feel free to jump in. So, so I'll be very pragmatic. So uh, when you look bottom up, I think that many organizations, when they deploy cybersecurity, have a lot of issues which are not technical, which are completely business and uh, they are aware of, uh, of and, and they, they require attention because most of the cybersecurity stuff is not only not secret, it's quite simple. And you know, don't patch your system. It's completely simple. Problem is a lot of systems are unpatched. We still see the same types of attacks over and over again, which have been published years ago, but organizations aren't getting their act together. So the point I'm trying to make is that, and this is what we're why we, we, we want the discussion, what we've learned in our multi-stakeholder discussion domestically about developing our national cybersecurity standard, which follows the NIST framework, was that there was value in the discussion in the sense that we got the managers in the room. Notwithstanding what we got out of the discussion from the technical side of the, of the room, right? Now they are aware that this is something which is not, no longer an, an issue of the CIO or the technical people or some technical mumbo jumbo because we hire <coughs> managers in order that they make money for the company, not for security. But if managers don't get uh, serious about cybersecurity, then we don't, we don't get the job done. They have bad uh, patching and then they uh, infect all the other organizations in the system, like we saw in the WannaCry event in other countries, not in Israel. Any case, the, the point, the point I'm, because we patch, the point I'm making anyhow is that uh, I would think maybe you should try to uh, take the discussion also for practical advice, which is non-technical, but my, my uh, area is legal. For instance, the question, of does uh, implementing cybersecurity in an organization affect privacy. So it's like the elephant in the room, but when you do the deconstruction, you see that even under the EU GDPR, which is, uh, you know, the gold standard now in privacy, there are quite simple solutions within there for some areas. And uh, giving clarity on these types of, of uh, issues can help organizations utilize cybersecurity on the ground. More so, as cybersecurity professionals, uh, in this leadership, you can maybe even offer organizations ways of doing cybersecurity and privacy together because they do not conflict so much as one may say when he goes to the, the big words uh, just uh, mentioned when other people talk about. But people working, simple people working on the ground like myself, not uh, aiming for uh, big uh, diplomatic things, but how we can improve things but for the government, and it's important, then we can see a value there in prom promoting this type of conversation. So this is my, um, my, my well, reaction to the role of government in this discussion. Thank you very much for this contribution. I see David puts his hand up from Swiss side. <laughs> yeah, I, I would like to follow up on that. I think it's, uh, it's r security on the internet is shared. Um, security. We need security at all levels, be it from the simple user to a small and medium enterprise to multinationals to uh, to everybody actually, even governments. So we have all these different, We a government can't, uh, as to quote Marina from the Global Forum for Cyber Stability, is that correct? She was also saying, we 
the government cannot supply security for everybody in the cybersecurity domain. We need all to participate, and I think this is a great place to discuss and openly what are the processes, what are the capacities, what are, what are the issues that are coming up, and we're, we're right now standing before the next tide, the whole IOTs in the next five years is going in very different sectors. We'll be have traffic, we have medical devices, many things that are r offer great possibilities for the future, but that will be so dispersed across society. So we need all the actors to come together and discuss this. So I can only follow up that we need from a government side also um, a multi-stakeholder approach to that. Thank you. Well, it has always been the mantra of the IGF that no stakeholder group can do it alone. They all have to work together. So what do you want? Yes, there, is a Sorry? there is a request from the back. Uh, oh, okay. Back. Well, let's give them a call. No, no, let's, let's go give the remote. Yeah. Mike Nelson from Glasgow. We know him well. Hello, Hi. Mike. <laughs> Hi, go ahead. You can see him on the news. This is his face. Mike, go ahead, please. 
Yes, Th thank you, Mike, uh, for that. And thank you also for uh, your commending our work. Uh, that, that means quite a lot to me, as I know you can also be very critical if you want to be. So <laughs> the fact that you're very positive must mean something. <laughs> Uh, we had Walters on the... Um, please introduce yourself. Of course. Th thank you, Marcus. My name is uh, Walters Natris. I've been involved with uh, basically the BPFs from the very beginning in 2014. Um, as some of you around the room know, I've been doing extensive work this year on finding out how the IGF could actually be, be better, more, more focused, more prioritized, etc. Uh, there will be a report on that somewhere in the beginning of the new year that will be presented to the MAG as they requested some extensive work <coughs> in this direction. Um, <coughs> one of the outcomes was, and I think that that is important perhaps also for the BPF to, to consider in the, in the near future, is that I've been engaging with governments and industry as well as other uh, stakeholders but from industry and governments, we usually hear here we don't have the resources and the time to participate in this sort of fora. So I've been asking them what would actually make it possible for you to engage. And what came out of it is that a few things are important for, for them to participate. The first is it has to be a prioritization that is of importance to them. The second is that it really needs to be focused and it has to have some sort of intended out outcome. Because otherwise, they, they say, usually with them we just drift away because we're just talking and nothing is, is going anywhere. So some sort of a formulation of a, of a goal is, of es is for us essential to, to have. And that is something which I think the, the BPFs have, so for the three years that I've been actively, actively participating, it's always open and more topics come in and even more topics come in and it intends that there's almost no <coughs> concrete outcome anymore <coughs> in most of those topics because it's just a list of potential topics to, to discuss. So the recommendation that I'll be going to give is to be more focused and be more and leave all the other things aside for, an, for a next year and perhaps then you will have the traction and engagement. Um, another thing I would like to comment on the two gentlemen sitting here is that yes, there's things that governments do in cybersecurity that they do and that they will never tell about, but the other comments make it quite clear that there's an interest for governments to interact because it is about securing devices and what Mike Nelson has been saying, perhaps what the added value here could be is to make a distinction between the things governments think they should be doing and the thing that the interacting with the people who are really knowledgeable on the technique itself could actually lead to a sort of regulation or self-regulation that would change things. Then as a last thing, and I've been saying this for the past five years, uh, sorry, five days here at the IGF, and we'll do so again in the, plen in the plenary in a few moments at, at the stock taking session. But if we were to take one topic as a pilot in 2018, and I use as an example IoT, and it could be anything with IoT, and we say to each other, two years from now, there will be no devices being sold on the market that don't have a unique identifying password. You could do a million things on these IoT devices, but then they come on the market and they're probably not that easily hackable. People like end users will be protected, but also governments, institutions will be protected. So it's n a non-discriminatory topic. Everybody wherever in the world profits in exactly the same way. So that may lead to not as much resistance as we say we're going to take care of duties to care in ICT. That's the top of the mountain. The other one is one topic. If that would work, we prove to the world that the IGF could actually take on a topic like that, bring in the necessary stakeholders, and if that is a success, then we will have other topics we may be much more complex, bring it into the IGF, and then taken out and say, regulatory officers have to do this, industry has to take care of that, governments need to start an awareness program, and they have them in their country, so use the, the channels that already exist, 
etc., etc. And that may actually be a great way forward, and that is one of the recommendations that were made in the session on Sunday. So that, with that, I'll thank you for the five minutes again, but you know my hobby horse, but I think there is a lot of positive uh, thoughts around it. So let's see if we can actually make it happen in 2018. Th thank you, and uh, actually I'm very glad we're having this session, which was not been originally planned. I think it proves a very good discussion, and I think it will also enrich uh, the final what you put. Uh, I was just one comment on the one issue issue. <laughs> we had a similar discussion with the dynamic coalitions this morning, and it appeared when we had the main session yesterday, they began to sort of look at various issues from different perspectives because you know IoT is one of these examples which affects uh, sort of virtually everybody. And there was, a, I think, on the one hand, a strong feeling it would be useful for the dynamic coalitions to coalesce one issue, but then on the other hand, the difficulty of choosing the issue, uh, you know, the, the high level agreement to have one issue is one thing, but then going into the nitty gritty of agreeing on one issue is yet another thing. But that's just a side remark. But yes, please and also introduce yourself. Uh, I need to leave, but I know that when governments leave the room, sometimes it has the different connotations. <laughs> I have a plane to catch, so <laughs> I thank you for the, the wonderful discussion. Well, I'm going to Jackson, so. And <laughs> so we, we both are leaving because we need to continue the discussions outside. No. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, so thank you for the discussion. I'm looking forward to hearing about your work. Thank you so much. Thank you. And if you don't mind, we add you to the mailing list, yeah? yeah. So I have your email, so we can add you to Well, you seem to be very attuned to our discussion for, uh, at, a <laughs> high, at a high political level. You know, it's, uh, and I think as you know, know us now, I think it would be great to have you on the mailing list and then on the next call or so. That would be even greater, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining us and safe travels back. And we obviously understand that people have their own travel schedules. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yes, Mike, please.
Oh, that was uh, Amit Ashkenazi, his legal advisor in the Prime Minister's Office of the National Cyber Directorate or Cyber Bureau. So hopefully he will uh, keep, keep active. And, th yeah. and thank you, Mike, and uh, for your suggestions. Uh, you have been in the queue for quite a while. <laughs> Hello everyone, um, sorry for my voice. Uh, it seems a cold has struck uh, everyone at the IGF, uh, but I'm Louise Marie Urel. I am a researcher at a think tank over in Brazil and coordinating a project on cybersecurity and digital liberties over there and also uh, at LSE, um, based in the UK then. Um, so I, I've been following the VPF uh, throughout this uh, past year and it has been a very interesting experience um, well, I have been following more closely and have been talking a bit, uh, a lot with um, Martin throughout these past months. And I think one of the things that I heard in the other session on cybersecurity capacity building that I think might be interesting to bring to this discussion over here is exactly the thing that what does the IGF have to con contribute to the discussion on cybersecurity? And I think we have very much the, the challenge of answering that question every time we think about how we go uh, to the next year, and I, I'd s and and the thing that I heard in the other session that I think it's interesting is that the IGF has built and has matured uh, of, of and and internet governance as a whole can deliver a lot on the discussion about multi-stakeholder approaches, and and even though that seems very obvious, I think we 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 don't think very much about it. And I think we have to think more closely to how we can translate the experience in internet governance and the experience in internet governance spaces with regards to multi-stakeholder approaches to cybersecurity. And um, it seems as if uh, we, we keep on saying that cybersecurity is a shared concern, cybersecurity is a shared responsibility, and cybersecurity is transversal to the interests of different stakeholder groups, but how do we go about it? Right, and I think that's that's the core of what we're trying to do over here at this uh, at the BPF, and and I really agree with the idea of IoT, uh, even though it's very challenging. Um, I think uh, as 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 we were discussing a couple of minutes ago, I think we can look at this same issue through different perspectives and kind of get a multi-dimensional perspective of what cybersecurity means in the context of IoT. So that responds more or less to what um, Michael was saying right now. I, I, I'm sorry, but I really don't think we should go to the, to the discussion on taxonomy and, and terminology, even though it is a political debate as well of, of, of who gets to define what cybersecurity is. I really don't think we should um, try to define cybersecurity. Otherwise, we'll just 
keep on banging our heads into the same discussion. And, and I think a way to try to get those answers and define what cybersecurity is in practice is by looking at the practice of it and by looking, for example, at cyber, um, at IoT and how different actors have been going about what are their perspectives of uh, ensuring security in IoT devices. Uh, how does, a, 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 how can I say, how does a, a, a user-centric approach to, to cybersecurity inform the ways that we can look at IoT devices? So we want to secure the end user. We want to secure those that are using these devices. So how do we go about, how, what is the, the, the question of security that inflicts them? So it might be, I want to get home and I want to I wanna make sure that my the data that I'm, I'm, I'm putting into these devices are not being shared with third parties. Uh, that being like from a, a, a user awareness kind of thing. And on the other side, companies trying to ensure that they can deliver uh, security by design or, or, or security by default. Uh, and developers, on the other hand, going about the development of these kind of uh, devices since the beginning, uh, how, how, do we, how do we ensure that? So I think that it kind of encompasses a lot of the discussions that we have been trying to tackle. And it goes back to things that we have been working throughout these years in the cybersecurity BPF. And, and uh, even though it can be kind of like a Pandora's box by opening like the box of IoT, I think it can deliver a couple of uh, insights. And I think just, just to close up already, um, uh, I don't have an answer for that, but I really think we should be very careful in not falling into getting to next year uh, if the BPF is renewed, uh, to get to next year and just have a list of diagnoses, uh, like a, a list of, of what are the problems, but actually trying to think about, okay, so this is the way these different actors perceive uh, security and IoT devices, for example, and, and in the end actually having a best practice, like how are different countries doing that? I know for in the case of Brazil, for example, we are establishing an IoT national plan right now. We're having discussions. So this is like a policy side of it. So I think there, there are a couple of, of good uh, road ahead. Uh, if we kind of go this way. Just wanted to, I, I know it has been a bit long, but I just wanted to contribute with that, thanks. Thank you for that. Other comments? Yes, Cedric, and please so introduce yourself. Um, I actually think taxonomies are useful if you get away from taxonomies kind of enumerating technical issues, but we should, um, are we are utterly lacking on taxonomies of actually the, the real damages that are done. So to be honest, I don't really care as a business owner or a, a user if my computer is broken because it was a buffer overflow or a format string vulnerability or whatnot. I just care that it's not available or that my data is gone. So, and I also think that's something that's relevant for businesses or governments because it, that's the damages. If there's no damages, then probably it's not really a problem. So. Um, that's just so much for uh, taxonomy. So I, I do think they have their value. And the other thing is we, we always talk about the multi-stakeholder approach and I quite like that, but what I seem to miss a lot is that we actually define who the stakeholders are and what their responsibilities are. I often at this meeting kind of feel we, we, we start passing on the hot potatoes, like the government should, and then the government say, actually, that's not our job. And and the domain industry said, we're not responsible for, for content, that's someone else. And but we, we kind of never avoid saying, well, it seems that X is responsible to do this, and maybe then investigating if this is truly the case. It doesn't always seem to be, the thing we see on first side is not always what's obvious, but I, I feel that's an avenue that we really should go in. And then the, the third thing, which I was also mentioning yesterday, is that we really should look at how uh, different best practices work in different contexts. I think uh, like we had an interesting discussion this morning about reaching out to Africa. A lot of the things that we do here will not work in Africa, just because things are different. And Maybe we should also have a look at that because I feel it's very important that all stakeholders are on board, not just the ones we think are stakeholders. 
Thank you. You forgot to introduce yourself. <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is Serge Ross. I'm working for a managed security provider in my day job, and uh, my kind of passion really is first, where I'm a member of the board. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Bevel Wooding. I am, among other things, the director of the Caribbean Network Operators Group. And just to build on the, the last two comments, you know, we did an, a very interesting experiment last April in Belize, where I was approached to help them deal with framing the issue of cybersecurity. And uh, we thought it would have been an excellent opportunity to bring multiple stakeholders together to look at what the implications of cybersecurity would be for, for that country. Um, and in putting together an agenda for what became a one-week symposium, uh, we started off with a, a, a full day of what we're calling cyber awareness, where we introduced the terms and dealt with the, the, the kinds of acronyms that would normally be familiar to those in the know, but not so much to, to new groups. And from that day onward, we broke into fora dedicated to the judiciary and uh, law enforcement, to the public sector, to the general public, to the network operators, to the business community, and to the financial services sector. Now, each of these groups um, look at, looked at and continue to look at cybersecurity from their very different lenses. But in putting it inside of the frame of a national cybersecurity symposium, we got them to look at the same thing at the same time. And uh, the interesting thing about the experiment was that we had the attorney general the Chief Justice, the Police Commissioner, the Deputy Prime Minister, the Head of the Chamber of Commerce, the Head of the Central Bank, all on a panel on that first day, telling the national community that they were going to look at this um, issue of cybersecurity and its impact on the country together. And this was in the face of existing local conflicts and um, competition and all the other things that would have prevented these people from talking in the past. At the end of each day and at the end of each forum, uh, we had the stakeholders who had very narrow focus, um, focal points. We had them um, define their specific areas, priorities for national cybersecurity. And then on the final day, a task force was set up, a national task force that has been working since April to now to produce a draft national cybersecurity agenda with the full contribution of all of the relevant stakeholders. Now, I, I felt that this, this was not something that should remain a Belize um, um, discovery. And I, I think uh, it, it really represented a wonderful intersection of the, the multi-stakeholder approach that is so common in internet governance, applying itself to, in a very practical way, to cybersecurity at a national planning level. Thank, thank you for this. Very fast. I think this is the best practice that we could share, can't we? For instance, yes. If, if you could <laughs> make sure that we have some input over there, Nicholas, then it may be something for the report. Uh, uh, yes, Louise. Uh, I Thank <coughs> you. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay. Me? Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to input, I, 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 I'm not saying like no taxonomy. I just think we can go about taxonomy in a different way and I think it is important really. And I agree with Michael when he says cyber is everywhere and it, it is nowhere at the same time. So yeah, I just want to make that clear. And another thing, I think these kind of stories and these kind of experiences that have been going on at the national and regional level, there, they, this is a way that we can explore, and I think that's the value, for example, of reaching out to the NRIs. You know, you're, I think we are going to get very much more of these uh, experiences out there once we get to the NRIs. So I think this kind of confluence, kind of like thinking ahead, um, I think it is crucial for us to have this kind of um, cross pollination, and and so we can actually get these people that perhaps are at the NRIs and they're working with cybersecurity and that they can sit on the table and also like share what they have been doing at the national and regional level. So just wanted to comment on that, thanks. Thank you, and Sivas? Yeah, uh, Sivas Subramanian from uh, Internet Society in the HNA. I just want to react to this gentleman's question. How do you identify stakeholders in uh, multi-stakeholder process? 
And uh, the best way is to make a start and uh, follow the model of uh, the IGF uh, stakeholders or ICANN stakeholders, where, again, it's not perfect. It's an evolving process. But then it's much, much better than uh, a government-only pro process or a government with business process. I totally agree. I, I was wondering, I, I, um, with the IOTs, I, I think it'll be quite difficult because it's too large of a subject. Um, you're speaking about unique passwords, but that would be for um, objects that we buy in our daily life. But the IOTs that we're going to put into cars, into medical devices, that is a totally different area. So we need to be very specific. But I think taking an object and studying it in different ways would be very interesting. I really like the, um, the example, the story of Belize, because it's given the story, we have a narrative that anybody can follow, how it happened, how people got involved. So taking an object and very precisely and then making maybe a bit of a story around it, what happened, what is positive, what could be the negative outpacks, but that we can illustrate step by step um, so anybody, that would also, in a sense, go to the taxonomy because we would be talking of, sp of specific um, real-life examples that sort of anchor um, and illustrate what we, what we want to mean, what we want to show by best, pra best practices. So I think that could be a, a possibility. And to go back, I think it's good to take a precise object to go for that. Thank you. Uh, we are sort of... 15 minutes left. We can, of course, go beyond the hour. I think there's nobody anymore after us. That's already, there's only one mm -hmm. session that's been open. Um, but uh, I would hesitate to do that as we have the open mic session. And I would sort of like move towards wrapping up of the session. I think it was a very good discussion, and I was particularly encouraged that we have government representatives, and I see Christine from Mission for Canada in the room, another government representative. So, uh, and uh, that was one of our concerns that we did not have enough government buy in. And I thought the comments, both by uh, Amit and by you, uh, I think were very helpful to see how we can engage uh, governments. And yes, we do understand that governments don't want to give away their secrets, <laughs> but there is a level of engagement uh, well below the level of secrecy. and. I think all the examples mentioned were very helpful. And going forward, we don't have to agree now on what our priorities would be. Uh, what Serge mentioned, also the uh, capacity building aspect and the developing country aspect of the uh, Africa. This also one of our themes. We talked about the growing uh, cybersecurity divide, uh, the digital divide in terms of cybersecurity. This, uh, and this would, of course, be very much within the mandate also of the UN. I mean, as a development is an important aspect of the SDGs. So that is definitely, and this is one of the possible uh, themes we set for next year. Uh, and the other, as I said right at the beginning, we can also make reasoned suggestions to the uh, broader IGF community at large, not just for us as a best practice forum, but these are issues worth looking at. And that is, uh, I think, something uh, we would like to drive over. That we don't have to wait for the Comac to say, yes, you go on, we can carry on. And also to bring in, uh, have a dialogue with the NRIs, maybe have a dedicated call. I like the best practice example of Belize. That is a very good example of how one can build uh, cyber capacity. But uh, with all that, uh, I would like to give it back. And the roles and responsibilities of stakeholders is actually touched upon in our uh, report. But obviously, that can be refined as we move along. We don't have a final answer, and I don't think we ever will have. I think this is very much a, a fluid uh, concept. But I would like to hand back to you. We took so we took lots of notes, and I think you share my impression that we had a very good discussion, and maybe also Wim can comment on, as he holds the pen, but uh, well, thank you all for your input, and over to you, Martin. Thank you, Marcus, and uh, yes, I've been taking a lot of notes because I plan to mail them out to the list so everyone who couldn't attend uh, also has some insight in what was discussed. And 
I think what I've heard from all participants is that there's actually a little bit of tension between a few areas. There's very tactical things we can help get done in the near future, but which may actually be a little bit less applicable to the group that is contributing today, may even be a little bit less inclusive of some groups that have less of a responsibility there. On the other hand, there's the more high-level issues that have come up before. Now, there's one thing that kind of came back from a few people, and which I really like, and it was Louise Marie's suggestion to take an issue and then apply a cross-cutting approach where we actually have a look at the tactical things and the groups that need to be involved in that, and we have a look at different perspectives. Um, and in many ways, that's also the suggestion of, uh, of Bevin from Belize, where uh, they have done something similar with a much wider issue than we would probably tackle because they're really focused on cybersecurity. Um, but that led to really good outcomes. And I think this can be particularly helpful because if you look at the last few years of reports, there are two or two or three cases that always come back a bit in terms of applicability and how people used our output. The first one, I think, is the uh, BPF on CSERT. The document that we published the first year was taken up as pre-reading for another major conf conference. The document that we wrote the second year was actually used by one particular CERT to help set up their operation. So it turned out to be very practical. If we look at the um, BPF on cybersecurity, we had two, two items that actually came out of that document last year that have been reflected back to me at least uh, since. One of them was um, a best practice from Nigeria on how to communicate around cybersecurity issues within a particular stakeholder group. That was a very specific example of how that happened. The other one was the case study that we had from uh, Korea on a national DDoS shelter and how that actually helped. I think if we take any of these challenges, um, and that could be Internet of Things, could be another topic, and we apply that cross-cutting approach, we can actually, I think, achieve a lot of the things that Wout mentioned earlier, as in we would have some very tactical, practical things that people can do, yet at the same time we can use it to fine-tune our definitions. So I'm kind of making Louise Marie's point here again, I think, because it is a very, I think it's a very a practical way of actually finding that middle ground between these two areas where we've historically had a little bit of, I'm going to call it tension, I don't think that's really what it is, but let's say different points of view within the group. So I think that's something that as a group we can continue to use the mailing list, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Marcus, uh, to continue discussing that and figuring out what that looks like and what our goals would be for the next year. And I think if we start doing that immediately after the conference, we can come up with a very strong proposal or a strong set of suggestions for the MAC, and then based on uh, the outcome of really the IGF in general and all the cybersecurity discussions that took place, I think we can find, to a, find a good middle ground on the a practical topic to move forward on. So that's a little bit my high-level takeaways, but I have much more detailed notes, and of course I'd be happy to share them. And uh, also from my end, I just wanted to flag one thing that I found particularly valuable this year is actually the contributions that come from completely different points of view. And my opinion has been changed by discussion that we had in the group multiple times, and I kind of hope that was also the case for others who participated and, and contributed, because I think that shows the value of all coming together in this group and, uh, and providing input. I think that's it for me, Marcus. Well, thank you very much for that. Win, would you have? Uh, this is about Donatus. I would like to reiterate what Martin was doing, showing our successes. And we are very bad at celebrating our successes. So how can we make sure that they're on the IGF website? We have four iterations of BPFs now, and things have changed in the world because of them. So how can we make show the world that that's happened? And that will probably lead to traction, because success is something people want to be a part of. And often the feedback I get on the best, best practice for is they're not doing anything, nobody does anything with them, and it's just not true. So let's try and find a way with the Secretariat to put it on. A very good now point, then. but uh, Louis is here, he's in charge of the website, so. <laughs> <laughs> or yet. I wasn't going to comment, but I agree so strongly with that that I that I feel we really should try and do something. Um, sorry, I'm Anred Israelson from, from APC. We've worked in other best practice forums very intensively. With this one, we've really just been following. 
but that's absolutely a problem across the board and there are very helpful policy recommendations. We're using them, we're using them at national level and regional level. And I think this is a challenge for the Secretariat, I don't know, it, but it's also for, for those of us. But in specifically, I think outreach to member states. That's, that's what I would particularly like to see because fr it's coming from a developing country, um, I'm from South Africa, but I work a lot with governments all over Africa. Their takeaway from the IGF is that pr it produces no concrete or useful outcome, but it does. And um, I think, frankly, I don't know if the Secretariat can do that on its own to change no. that perception. I think we need to do that. I've been talking to the Germans who are <laughs> hosting the next uh, 2019 IGF because I also think we need to get the host country to also be willing to, to instead of having high-level events the day before, maybe having an event the day before which is really just <laughs> about presenting um, best practice forum outcomes to governments. But that's just an idea, but well I agree with you, it's a priority. I'm willing to put time <coughs> into solving the problem. But we have been notoriously bad at that, at selling ourselves. We've just done our job, but uh, <laughs> not been good at selling ourselves. And the point you made, I talked also, that was at the session the Germans organized, and that was also my main message. Please, you are a member of the GA, use your political clout to put the IGF in Germany on the map of other governments. And the absence of, we talked about governments, but we had a, uh, a last minute participant from the government of Israel. He works in the cyber bureau of the prime minister. For, and he was actually very much in line with what we have been doing. And uh, so there is hope, but we need champions in governments who actually promote us. wanted to come in. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me start by uh, first um, appreciating the work done so far. Um, uh, moving forward from what she said, I think uh, some of us here need to become an ambassador of um, Best Practice Forum on Cyber Security. Uh, let me use an example of what I did. I think for the first time, uh, from our own part, own side, I brought a representative of Nigerian military to this IGF. And uh, not just a representative of the military, and a representative of uh, the, uh, the, the government of Nigeria responsible for implementing cyber security in the country. And the whole idea is that uh, when you grab Nigeria, it will be easy to grab West African region. And now that is uh, the success I believe that we have recorded here, yeah, or probably, as you say, have recorded here. Yeah. Now, how do we improve on this? I think, like you said, Michaels, there's a need for us to put a uh, best policy firm on the map of the government because it's really very, very important. I have this notion or this impression that the multi-stakeholders um, engagement is usually not inclusive of government and uh, you find government not wanting to be part of the process because they feel like uh, they don't have uh, much to say. It, it's all about uh, community discussing and all that. But I think that is changing. From Nigerian perspective, it's changing. And from West African perspective, I think it's changing. And um, if we can improve on that, uh, you know, targeting the core implementers within the government because if you bring a policy maker of um, general policy maker of government or whatever, and you don't bring in the core implementer within the cyber security um, area, we are still gonna have a problem. But when you bring in the implementers of cyber security within the government uh, setting, I think it will have more effect. Let me give an example. I brought in the head of the head and the coordinator of the national cyber security strategy in Nigeria for the first time. When he came here, he was overwhelmed with the load of information, interaction, and uh, the opportunity that in existing here. So I think the problem is that uh, we have not been able to communicate the values of Best Parties Forum across those who are really in need of it. So if there is something we should improve upon, I think we should be really more focused in bringing the call, those that are in need of the outcome of the Best Practice Forum. So I, I just want to encourage us 
that really to improve it should start from us. I like what you did. You 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 brought in. Uh, I think the government of Netherlands, right? The uh, much around because I read a lot about the duty to care. Uh, I don't know if uh, they use some of what we are doing here, but really, if we target the real government agencies or the representative of government that are uh, whose responsibility are within the uh, framework of cyber security, I think it will be of, of much value. Thank you. Thank you for all that. To clarify, it was the Dutch Cyber Security Council, which is an advisory body of the Dutch, and I brought them to the IGF for the first time. Yes. We have to wind up, but I just want to give Wim the opportunity maybe to comment from his perspective as the pen holder for the report. Thank you. Very, uh, sorry, very brief. Um, well, I will make two comments. Well, one, I will say that this, uh, this BPF, um, I mean, I will thank the leadership of the BPF. And I will, but I would like to extend the leadership of the BPF to the five, six, seven more people that were involved and really contributed, because that is, from my perspective, um, that made it really easy to, in a short amount of time, really capture what was going on, um, step in, and also make it uh, make it uh, what it is today. And I think it, it's it's successful because it it was a step further in what uh, what was done. So, and that that is linked back um, to really being able to making the bridge between the work that was done last year, continuing and going on, not sit and wait till something comes from the IGF, but it, I think it are the people around this table um, that with the help of, of uh, Maarten and, and Marcus made that the BPF set a step further. So I think you, you also have to look at the BPF from that, uh, that point. Uh, the second remark I wanted to make is um, about tension, I think Martin said something more or less similar um, because I, I see there is some tension also because the BPF you want from from the BPS, you want to reach out, you want, want to be inclusive. On the other si side, I hear um, people saying, okay, but we should dive deeper. We should focus on a couple of topics. And uh, I don't have an opinion on that, <laughs> but I always see that tension because the more you invest in being inclusive, bringing more people around, um, the more you bring also different topics on the table. And that's something I see it in this BPF, I see it in other BPFs. I put it on the table just to, um, uh, as a reflection. Um, I have no opinion what's the best, but <laughs> uh, take yeah. it. But thank you all um, for the work, because I was pleased to work on this, <laughs> because well, it's a, and it was a doable to do it in such a short time because of your work. Thank you for your comments and above all for your work. And what you just said is perfectly normal, that we are people, people have strong opinions and it's natural tension that is bound to happen. That you go, either you go deep uh, in a vertical sense or you go broad in a horizontal sense. And there is a, an intersection between the two and that is this, I would say, tectonic tension. But this is no, uh, it's nothing bad. I mean, this is normal in a process like this. And I would like to thank you all for your active participation throughout the year. It's really members driven and above all, I would like to thank Mark that he was really done the heavy lifting and the work. Thank you. Mark. <laughs> and with that, we close our session and we leave it up to Wim and to Martin to tie it all together. And it's even improved on the report, and I'm confident it will be excellent. Yeah. <laughs> and then we will move on, and we have our next call in January before the next MAC. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus. That's very good. Thank you, man. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you also had the main session. Yeah. Yes, I saw you walking yesterday.